I would like to welcome you to the workshop series titled Management of Money Impacts Eternity. The presenter, Tom Copeland, is a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ who has been called to teach God's Word on Finances since 1982. Tom has helped thousands of people learn and apply God's financial principles. Tom is the founder and president of Copeland Financial Ministries, and his financial moments are aired on numerous radio and TV stations. Now, here's Tom teaching, Management of Money Impacts Eternity. I'd like to welcome you to session three of the series called Management of Money Impacts Eternity. The topic for this session is the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne. I'm going to, like, I'm going to talk about the Bema, or some would refer to as the day, in other words, the judgment seat of Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, Paul said, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due him for things done while in the body, whether good or bad. It's important to understand that all Christians will stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ, and that we will receive rewards or lack of rewards for the things we did while we are here on earth, whether good or bad. People who have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that, that is genuine Christians, will be forgiven for their sins as Christ paid the penalty for us on the cross and all Christians will spend eternity in heaven. However, the rewards distributed by God in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ will be quite different for each individual. For those Christians who have not been good stewards of the resources that God has given to them, they're going to suffer a loss in the, by, the, by suffering having fewer rewards or maybe in some cases no rewards in heaven. More specifically, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, speaking to believers, Paul said, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day, that is the judgment seat of Christ, will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire, that is God's fires, will, be, will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survived, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. Our works are what we did with the resources that God entrusted to us, things like money, possessions, time, natural abilities, and spiritual gifts. God's fire will reveal the quality of these works at the eternal, and the eternal significance of what we did while we're here on earth with those resources. The works represented in this parable by gold and silver and costly stones will be purified by the fire and will benefit us in heaven for eternity. But our works represented by wood, hay, and straw will be burned up and not rewarded for God, by God. What about works that result in eternal benefits? Here are some examples of what I believe would be some works that would result in, um, in rewards in heaven. I think first, anything that you do that results in the salvation of people which obviously would include giving money and time to your local church and giving to evangelical Christian organizations and witnessing for Christ. An individual's salvation lasts for eternity. Number two, anything that we do for the Lord with the right motive. Proverbs 16.2 says, All a man's ways seem innocent to him, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Works rooted in pure motives will be rewarded. At the judgment seat of Christ, all others will be burned. Number three, giving generously to God's work will certainly be rewarded in heaven. Matthew 19, 29, Jesus said he, he's going to reward us a hundredfold when we give up, give up things of a material nature. Number four, serving the Lord faithfully wherever God has called you to minister. It could be your church, a parachurch organization, or it could be informally to your family and friends. These things will be rewarded. Number five, giving to God's work confidentially. Remember in Matthew chapter 6, the Pharisees would announce their giving with trumpets so they would be honored by men. But Jesus said, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will receive no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, if we give to God's work confidentially, without boasting or without using money to manipulate, there will be tremendous rewards waiting for us when we get to heaven. So in light of the fact that Christians are going to stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ, the wise Christian will follow the instructions in Hebrews chapter 12, which states, Therefore, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. I think one key thing that we need to do here as Christians in serving the Lord and, and doing things of an eternal value 
is to determine God's calling for you and fulfill it. Besides managing and utilizing the money that God's entrusted to you according to His principles and His specific will, we need to determine and fulfill what God's called us to do. In Romans 11.29 it says, For God's gifts and His calling are irrevocable. irrevocable. God's gifts and His call are irrevocable. Unbelievable. Ephesians 2.10 it says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, God does have a calling and a specific work for His children while they serve Him here on earth. So if a Christian discerns and fulfills God's calling for him or her, there will be significant rewards when they get to heaven. Remember, God is for us and not against us, Romans 8.31, and even though Christians will spend eternity in heaven, there will be different levels of rewards and different levels of authority in heaven. Have a look at the parable of the ten minas, Luke chapter 19. For those who have served Christ faithfully with their time, talent, and money, the judgment seat of Christ will be a great time of celebration. Now what about Christians who have not used God's money God's way? What about those? For those Christians who have not utilized the money, material things, their time, and spiritual gifts for, the, for God's glory, they're going to suffer loss by way of having few or maybe even no rewards in heaven. Believers in Jesus Christ will be saved and spend eternity in heaven. However, there's no second chance. I think this is really important. There's no second chance for anyone to come back to this fallen world and invest money, time, and talents for God's kingdom that will result in treasures in heaven. Once we die, it's too late to go back and change our life. So the wise Christian invests their money, time, and talents in areas that are going to result of eternal value, that are significant for God's kingdom. When we get to heaven, I suspect that many Christians will have wished that they had given more to God's work, avoided unnecessary expenditures, spent less on themselves, and invested more of their money, time, and talents in ministry, resulting in eternal benefits in heaven. Recommendation, faithfully apply the biblical financial principles and give very generously to God's work with respect to money, time, and your talents and spiritual gifts for the work of the Lord. After that, you can completely trust God to reward you generously in heaven and for eternity. For sure, you don't want to get to heaven and regret how you used money while you were here on earth. And remember, money is very temporary, and a split second after you die, you will lose it. Remember what Jim Elliott, that well-known missionary, said, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And particularly with respect to money, as the saying goes, you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. God will bring every deed into judgment. Except for Jesus Christ, Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. As, and he, as he wrote the book of Proverbs, as well as the book of Ecclesiastes, towards the end of, end of his life, here's what Solomon's wise conclusion. Now all has been heard, and here is the conclusion of the matter. What about non-Christians, you may ask? Only Christians, that is, people who have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Overall, it will be a good time, as believers will receive rewards based upon their faithfulness to God and utilizing money, time, talents, with a pure heart for the kingdom of God. However, for the non-believers, they will not appear before the judgment seat of Christ, but rather they will appear before the great white throne judgment, as described in Revelation chapter 20. I don't mean to be mean, but I need to speak the truth in love to those who have never accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord for your eternal benefit. It's nothing in this for me, it's for your eternal benefit. In Hebrews 9.27 it says, Just as a man is destined to die once, after that to face judgment. And 1 John 5, 11, 13 says, and this is the testimony, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you know that you have eternal life. In this scripture, life is referred to as eternal life in heaven with God. Therefore, the non-believer will not be spending eternity in heaven with God because of his or her decision not to accept Christ as Savior and Lord. Further, if, further, they will not be forgiven for their sins, but rather will be punished for their sins, as described in Revelation chapter 20 at the great white throne judgment. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Actually, I'm going to now give you the scriptures, uh, right from, from God's word, what it has in, on the great white throne judgment. Revelation chapter 20, 11 to 15 describes it. 
Then I saw a great white throne, and him, that is Jesus Christ, who was seated, seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which was the book of life. The dead, that is the spiritually dead, who had no relationship with Christ, were judged according to what they had done and as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and the death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what he had done. The death and the Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, and the lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. By my nature, I'm not a fire and brimstone kind of speaker, but it's so important that people understand that if they decide not to accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, then they will spend eternity in the lake of fire, and I want to help you avoid that horrific eternal consequence. In 2 Peter chapter 3, it says, By the same word, the present heavens and the earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment, and destruction of ungodly men. I'd like to now go through this chart that gives an overview of the similarities and the differences between the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne. And you can see the scriptures there, judgment seat of Christ, the scriptures is Romans chapter 14, 1 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians 5. The great white throne is described in detail in Revelation chapter 20 and referred to in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Who's going to be there? At the, at the judgment seat of Christ, it's going to be the Christians. The believers will be there. At the great white throne, it's going to be the unbelievers. Who's going to be the judge? In both cases, Jesus Christ will be the judge. What will be the purpose? At the judgment seat of Christ for the Christians, the purpose will be to reward faithful servants of God's children. Uh, and for the uh, great white throne, for the non-believers, the purpose is God's judgment on those who did not accept Christ. When's it going to occur? The, the judgment seat of Christ will occur after the rapture, after Christians are raptured up into heaven, which is during the tribulation, but before the millennial. With respect to the great white throne, it's going to occur after the millennial, but before the lake of fire. What will be the criteria for judgment? For the believers at the, the judgment seat of Christ, there will be no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 1. Faithful believers will receive rewards for their service to God. For the non-believer at the great white throne, everyone who is spiritually dead, that's the non-believer, who has not put his faith in Christ will be judged. There will be no defense and there will be no appeal. What will be the outcome? For the Christians, any good works done in the name of Jesus Christ will be rewarded. For the non-Christians, the spiritually dead will be thrown into the lake of fire eternally, separated from God's presence. Will all those who are judged receive equal treatment? The answer is no in both cases. For the Christian, each person's motives, the reasons for serving God will be uh, judged, their works and their service for the Lord, uh, per performed with pure motives, will be rewarded, and all others will be burned. For the non-believers, the non-Christians, they're going to be condemned. They'll be punished for their sins, the punishment will be worse for some as opposed to others, depending upon what each person has done. So those people that have done some really bad things while they're here on earth are going to be punished very se severely. Another distinction, the believers will receive credit for Jesus' righteousness, which delivers them from the punishment for their sin. So they're going to, they're going to be saved and spend eternity in heaven. The non-believers, because they've rejected God's gift of salvation, they rejected Jesus Christ, they will receive their due punishment for their sins. They're not going to be forgiven. What should we do about it now? For Christians, we should serve God with a pure heart and use the resources, all of the resources that God's provided to you, such as money, time, talent, spiritual gifts. Use them for eternal purposes. Make the paradigm shift and, and have an eternal perspective. For the non-believers, you need to repent. You need to accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and serve Him wholeheartedly. Do not wait. There may not be another chance. So if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I would encourage you to seriously consider the following. First, God loves you. Jeremiah 31.3 states, The Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with a loving kindness. God wants a personal relationship with you. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. 
Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. John chapter 10. However, our sin has separated us from God. In Romans 3.23 it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And here it is demonstrated diagrammatically. Man is on one side, and God is on the other. There's a huge chatham, a chasm in between. And, and basically, we're, we're separated from God. We're separated from God for, because of our sin. Many people will try to seek God the wrong way. Uh, good works, religion, philosophy. Um, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. And here the Bible is talking about spiritual death, that is separation from God for eternity. And here it is diagrammatically. Some people try to reach God and attain their salvation and go to heaven through good works, doing good things, being very religious or just their own philosophy or morality. I know for me, before I became a Christian on April 12, 1981, I always thought I was a good person. I worked hard. I didn't lie. I didn't cheat. I treated others, I thought, pretty fairly. I thought if there was a God and there was a heaven and a hell, I thought I'd make the cut. But that was my opinion. I, I learned later that uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, meaning that none of us can be holy and perfect like God. And that I realized. I wasn't perfect. Nobody's perfect. And so that's one of the first things I had to understand before I realized I needed, uh, I needed a Savior. I needed to accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. The next point I'd like to make is God has provided the only solution through Jesus Christ. Jesus answered, He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, John 14, 6. And I love Romans 4, 5, colon 8. Where it says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And here you can see it diagrammatically where the cross of Christ is enabling man to reach over and uh, have a f fellowship with God for eternity in heaven. But uh, the answer solution is, is Jesus Christ's death on the cross. That's the solution. So here's a question. Are you willing to do the following? Admit that you're a sinner. Be willing to turn from your sins and obey God. Believe that Jesus Christ died for you, that is, accept Christ as your Savior. John 3.16, Christ said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that's Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And then in prayer, accept Christ to come in and control your life through his Holy Spirit, that is, accept him as your Lord. Jesus said, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. The idea of coming into us is, uh, is to have that fellowship with the God of the universe so we can have that personal relationship with God and so we can spend eternity with him in heaven as well. And um, if, if you've been listening to this and, and you sense something tugging at your heart and you've never accepted and made a commitment to Jesus Christ, uh, that's not me. I'm just quoting some scripture. That's the Holy Spirit of God knocking at your heart, trying to encourage you to open your heart and your life to uh, God, to His Holy Spirit, and to be willing to do things God's way. And here's the prayer that, uh, that I'd encourage you to pray. I'm going to read it once, and then I'm going to pray it. Here's the prayer that I'm going to read. I'm going to pray in a minute. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner, and I need your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins. I am willing to turn from my sins. I now invite Jesus Christ to come into my heart and life as my personal Savior. I am willing by God's strength to follow and obey Jesus as the Lord of my life. If God's tugging at your heart and you've never made this decision, I would encourage you to bow your head right now and pray. You can say it out loud. You can say it quietly between you and God, whatever. But I'd encourage you from your heart to pray this prayer. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins. I am willing to turn from my sins. I now invite Christ to come into my heart and life as my personal Savior. I am willing, by God's strength, to follow and obey Jesus as the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, here are some of God's awesome promises. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of a human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. John 1, 12 and 13. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, then you're a child of God and you have the privilege of enjoying a personal relationship with the God of the universe and a whole, while you're here on earth and getting God's wisdom and direction on everything. But more importantly, you will spend eternity with, with uh, Jesus Christ in heaven. I'd like to now go back to rewards in heaven for believers who serve the Lord faithfully. 
In Romans chapter 2 it says, God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But to those who are self-seeking, who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good. Romans 2, 5 to 10. So clearly, when a Christian manages money according to biblical principles, then God's going to bless those believers, not only here on earth, but in, in heaven for eternity. As a practical matter, when you do your giving, consider giving to those who cannot repay you. In the parable of the great banquet, Jesus said, but when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So God's, you got to use money to provide for needs, not wants and desires of your family. Got to use it to save for future needs. But you sure have to make sure you make it a priority to give to God's work. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. And uh, God's going to bless you. It goes on to say, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Some of those barns build to over, like overflowing. Some of those blessings will come in eternity in heaven. Some of them will come here on earth. God may give you even more money or he could bless you with good health or a, a good marriage relationship or a good relationship with your kids or a great ministry. But some of those blessings will come in eternity. I'd like to now talk about uh, God's promises of crowns in heaven for faithful believers. There's several crowns that a Christian could earn while they're here on earth and receive them when they get to heaven. Here's some of them. An incorruptible crown. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul compared our life here on earth to that of a race. And here's what he said. Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. So we need to exercise discipline in all areas, including managing money, use it for God's purposes. Focus. We're in a race. Uh, we're, we're only running it while we're here on earth. And, and focus and do things that are going to have eternal benefit not only for yourself as rewards in heaven, but for others as well, those people who come to know Christ and those who get discipled and grow spiritually, etc. The second crown I'd like to mention is the crown of righteousness. The Apostle Paul said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race. Now I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And part of righteousness, righteous living, is certainly managing money God's way. The third one I'd like to mention is the crown of life. For many Christians, they will have to persevere under trials, including financial trials. But when you do, God promises another crown in heaven. James 1.5 says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Overall, for those believers who have managed money according to God's principles and God's specific will, including giving generously to God's work, they're going to receive many crowns in heaven for their faithfulness, their perseverance, and their righteousness. I'd like to now go through a, a summary of this session and the entire series of management of money impacts eternity. The Bible is clear that those people who do not accept Christ as Savior and Lord are going to live for eternity in the lake of fire separated from God. So again, I would encourage you to make a decision to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And if we could be of any help, please send an email to info at copelandfinancialministries.org. Again, info at copelandfinancialministries.org. As for Christians, after we've died, we will appear before the judgment seat of Christ and give account of our lives. Romans 14.10 says, You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Romans 14, 12 says, So then each of us will give account of himself to God. And 1 Corinthians 4, 2 states, Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Faithfulness to God is the key in managing all the resources he's given to us while we're here on earth. So when we get to heaven and individually stand before Jesus Christ, here are some of the questions that God could very well ask us. I've got several of them here. This is not intended to be all-inclusive. What did you do with the money and material things that I entrusted to you? 
Did you spend it unnecessarily, perhaps on your own selfish desires? Or did you invest money in my work? Number two, as you did things for me, the Lord, including giving, what was your motive? Was it pure or selfish? Selfish. Number three, how did you spend the time that I provided you on earth? Wasting it on things that are temporary in nature? Or did you focus on things of eternal value, such as involvement in evangelism and discipleship of people? And number four, did you utilize the natural talents and spiritual gifts that I gave you to disciple other believers and to witness to non-Christians? Those are some of the questions I think we could face. And remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, in speaking to believers, Paul indicated that during the judgment seat of Christ, God's fire will reveal the things that we did which result in eternal rewards as well as the, as well as the things that we did which were burned up that gave rise to no eternal rewards. God will judge our work for what it truly is. Good works, including giving, done in the name of Jesus Christ with godly motives, will be rewarded by, by God. To ensure that your efforts will be rewarded by God, be sure to learn and apply God's financial principles in managing the money that God's entrusted to you. There are many biblical principles that um, I do not have enough time to touch on in this session or this series, so I'd encourage you to go to our website, copelandfinancialministries.org. There's numerous resources available there. And remember, if you do not manage money God's way, there may be relatively few rewards when you get to heaven. And once you've died, you cannot come back to earth and live life all over again. There's no second chance with respect to building up treasures in heaven, as Jesus referred to in Matthew chapter 6. So the wise Christian will make it a point to learn and apply God's financial principles, make the paradigm shift from focusing on things of eternal value as opposed to things that are temporary in nature, and prayerfully discern God's will with respect to managing money. One final comment. Investing money in God's work is an excellent way to convert a temporal asset such as money into eternal benefits. I'd like to close in prayer. Father, I pray that you touch the hearts of everyone that's listening today, and especially those who have never accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that they would come and they would make a decision to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and receive his gift of eternal life, and then they, along with the other believers listening, would make it a point of focusing on things of eternal value, of investing their time, money, talents, in things that are going to count for eternity, as opposed to temporal things. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. To learn more, go to copelandfinancialministries.org. For example, you can watch all three sessions on the topic, Management of Money Impacts Eternity or download a free copy of the Copeland Budgeting System, or sign up for the Financial Moments and access numerous other resources, the majority of which are free. Again, copelandfinancialministries.org, or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter.